Today, as we come to the table, we must have solid teaching in the church, sound doctrine in the church. I believe line by line, verse by verse. I'm convicted of that. Not that you can't do other methods. Don't get me wrong. But I believe this is where the greatest soundness and systematic growth comes from. Because it's the only way to work through what God is telling us in the context and then say, God, now I see this. When I read this and today I I look over this and I'm gonna encourage you men before we're done to take this list home and pray over it. But when you take this list as a man and you pray over it, it's because God, God wants you to be that way and God hears that and God will begin to change your life. But the problem is we oftentimes hear it and then we just go home. Unfortunately, Christian growth isn't something you can just do on autopilot. You can't just hear wise teaching and then grow automatically. You have to take those words you've heard, hold them close to your heart, and actively apply them to your life. You have to put in an effort to grow closer to God. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, Senior Pastor of Calvary Knoxville. In today's message, Pastor Mark is encouraging the men listening to take action on the words that he's speaking. Even the most mature of Christians should still have a desire to learn more about God and grow a deeper relationship with Him. Growth never stops, even after our physical bodies pass away. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Titus, chapter 2, with today's edition of Come to the Table. If you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Titus chapter 2. And uh, we're going to look at verses, only verses 1 and 2 today. And that is we're going to be looking at the behavior of the church. And this is going to be a little bit of a journey through this. The older men and younger men, older women, younger women. And that can be age or just in the Lord. And then also looking at servants, which we'll be talking about employees And so uh, why don't we uh, read just these first couple of verses, kind of see where we're going. We'll pray, and uh, let's begin to dissect this and get into some some solid doctrine today. Notice in chapter 2 of Titus, verse 1, it says, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men may be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, and in patience. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you have given us sound doctrine. Lord, you've given us the eternal word of God. We have no question as to what you require of us as men, as women, as servants, as children, uh, Lord, as those in your church, and, and, and Lord, in every avenue, as leaders, as we saw last week, you've spoken very clearly to us. And so I pray that as we work through this, and you continue, God, just to strengthen your church and shore up your church and lay a solid foundation in our hearts that we would not only learn, Lord, the facts of what your church is to be and how we're to conduct our lives even outside the church, but God, I pray you'd make it very relational. I pray, God, this would be more than uh, just a few bullet points and facts that we need to function properly as a church, but we would see, hey, here's how we're to respond with you and with each other and the world around us as believers in the day in which we live. So open your word to us, God. We're excited about what you have for us today, and we uh, ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. And as I said, today we're going to be looking specifically at older men. This section he covers here uh, deals with, as we said, men and women and younger and older and both and all that. But we're only going to just break down what we have time for. We finished looking at the behavior of church leadership. So Paul now shifts gears and moves into, all right, that's how church leadership is to operate. How now is the church supposed to operate? And this would be very appropriate to write to a pastor. Remember, Pastor Titus was on the island of Crete. That was a very, very messed up island in a lot of ways. As far as the world went, it was a a place of drunkenness, a place of a lot of false gods and goddesses. It was a mess. They were known to be liars, gluttons, lazy, all these things that that, uh, Paul said were true about them. And Titus is the pastor to that island. How would you like to be called there? Well, at the same time, Paul's writing to Timothy, and Timothy also gets his letter in between. It it appears that Paul probably wrote 1 Timothy, then Titus, then 2 Timothy. And so both of these books, he's talking with pastors. He writes Pastor Timothy in Ephesus, 
So we see a lot of the same things covered in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And then he writes to Pastor Titus in Crete, uh, having that pastor's heart, that older pastor's heart, and now passing on to them what they need to pass on to the body of Christ. And again, I understand that heart the older I get because even as we're going to look at older men today, and as I, as I said, this can apply to older in age, uh, which it does to me now, and or older just in how long you've walked with the Lord. Um, either way, uh, you, it's something that you need to leave the next generation with, and Paul realized he didn't have much longer. So he writes it again from a pastor's viewpoint to pastors, but these things apply to us as the body of Christ as well because he's instructing the body of Christ. So we will be able to take these things home and apply them to ourselves uh, again if I appropriately present this to you today. So that's the, that's the prayer and that's the hope. Now again, why would the Lord be concerned about this as far as the behavior of the body? Again, because how the body acts around people around them, and in this instance in Crete, uh, the body of Christ, it's a witness to the world. So what Paul knew is the way that Titus conducts himself and the way that the church in Crete conducts themselves, that's how Crete is going to recognize God and see God as. Well, the same thing applies to us today in Knoxville. The way that Calvary Chapel or any other church conducts themselves out in Knoxville is how the church is going to be viewed to the people of Knoxville. You've probably heard it said before, sometimes it, it, it's oftentimes true, you're the only Bible some people may read. So how do we conduct ourselves? That's why Paul takes the time to say, now, because you know that, let's make sure we're conducting ourselves in the proper way so that we properly represent the Lord. The problem is there are times in the church where some not only do not represent the Lord properly, but they give the unbelieving world an excuse to mock and blaspheme. And this is the concern that Paul had, again, for Timothy and Titus and where they were. And it's a concern that I have as well for where we are today and looking at the Church of America. Now, of course, we're concerned with the church worldwide, but our first and foremost concern is right here in Knoxville, our own Jerusalem, and then America, and then the rest of the world, if you will. And so we want to see the church walking the way that it's supposed to walk and being the example that it's supposed to be. In his book, I Surrender, Patrick Morley wrote that the church's integrity problem is in the misconception, note this, that we can add Christ to our lives but not subtract sin. It is a change in belief without a change in behavior. Wow. And that sums it up. Listen, I as a pastor, I see today, I think the church not really walking in the holiness that God has called us to walk in. And I think a lot of it is what he's talking about here. For some reason, we tend to think that we can pray and ask God to forgive us of our sins, but we don't need to change. Listen to me. If you want to be right with God and you want to walk in a way that pleases God, it's confession is step one. You have got to repent. And what does repentance mean? It means stop doing what you know is wrong and start doing what you know is right. It takes action on our part. Now, I'm not taking away the power of the Holy Spirit to make this happen. We have to have the power of the Holy Spirit or we'll never be able to do this but we still have to respond to the Holy Spirit and allow God to do this. Mark, what would be an example of that? Well, for example, uh, it might be something where God says, all right, I want you to stop watching certain things or reading certain things or going certain places. Fill in the blank, whatever it is that's causing you to stumble, that's maybe pulling you into sin where you know you, places you know you don't need to be. So what do you do? Well, you trust in the power of the Holy Spirit and you pray for God to help you be free in these areas, but you stop going there. You stop reading that. You stop watching that. In other words, we have to take action on our part. And oftentimes, God, I believe, waits until we do take action to set us free. You say, well, I want to be set free. Are you taking the action necessary to be set free? I had a, a friend of mine contact me recently, and they've been struggling in a sin, an area of sin for many years now. And somebody that doesn't live here, so uh, nothing you can say, who could that be? You wouldn't know them. And I would never do that to anybody that could figure something out anyway. But he, he began to say, you know what? For years, I've had this situation. I kept telling him, say, look, you take this to the Lord and you set up the boundaries. And he would say, okay, I'm taking it to the Lord. I'm setting up the boundaries, but I'm still stumbling. Okay, you take it to the Lord. You set up the boundaries. And of course, I would say, and you need to pray. Ask for God's power. And we'd go back and forth, this same thing. He began to apply that to his life. It's a lifelong struggle that he'd had. And as he applied that to his life, he contacted me here just recently and said, you know what, not only have I been set free, he said, but God has even removed the temptation. Now, that doesn't mean we'll never be tempted again in areas where we struggle, but here's the principle that that shows. It's what I've experienced in my life and many of you have experienced in yours, and that is this. 
if we simply do the right thing, ask for God by his power to help us, God in his timing will set us free. Some people God sets free overnight. Other people God sets free over time. However God works in your life, he loves you, he's watching you, he wants to see your heart, do you really mean it? Is there full repentance? And that means turning from it. And this is where I talk about a lack of holiness in the church. Now, what does holy mean? Literally, the root of the word holy just means different. That's, that's the base root. Now, there's a lot more to it. But it means we're to be different. Well, different than what? Different than the world. We're not to live the way the world lives. We're to conduct ourselves in a different way, not in a holier than thou, not in a judgmental sense, in a humble way, but following God in righteousness. And so that's what Paul is saying here is when he's gonna be saying to the church, here's how you're supposed to live. And he's gonna address specifically the older men today. Here's how you're supposed to live as older men. But the goal is that we live holy unto the Lord. And again, I believe the church is in dire need of holiness today, differentness. You know, it's sad to me when I read some of these statistics, and I don't know who all does these, and sometimes they come across my desk, or you get an email, they send them to pastors, or they're in some article that I'm reading, and there are these groups that do these normal studies of churches. And they'll do them sometimes over extended amount of, of years to pastors, to people in the church body. And they call people all over the nation that, that say they're a Christian and they divide them up into evangelical or whatever, whatever. And then when they talk about, they ask them these questions, Sadly, statistically, there's very little difference oftentimes between the way the world thinks and is doing things and the way the church thinks and is doing things. And I believe the reason is a lack of sound doctrine, a lack of solid teaching. We must have solid teaching in the church, sound doctrine in the church. I believe line by line, verse by verse, I'm convicted of that. Not that you can't do other methods, don't get me wrong, but I believe this is where the greatest soundness and systematic growth comes from because it's the only way to work through what God is telling us in the context and then say, God, now I see this. When I read this and today I, I look over this and I'm gonna encourage you men before we're done to take this list home and pray over it. But when you take this list as a man and you pray over it, it's because God, God wants you to be that way and God hears that and God will begin to change your life. But the problem is we oftentimes hear it and then we just go home. We hear it and then we just do the next thing. As we need to really let God change us and ask ourselves, and I want you to think about this, am I holy? I'm not in some pious fake, you know. And what does holy mean? As we said, it doesn't mean it's not something you wear. Holy is not how you speak. Holy is not, you know, anything other than it's the fact that you're set apart for God. The different root just means you're different from the world. And to expound on that, you're set apart for the things of God. Are you holy? Are you different from the world? Number one, ask yourself that. Or, or, or could really, if somebody was to see you, they would say, you know, I didn't even know you were a Christian. But what, is, what, a, what a hard thing to hear. I didn't know you were a Christian. Ah, that's not probably good. You probably should have known. Not, not just because of how I live, but I probably should have said something ever so often that kind of acknowledged who I was, right? People should know that. And they should know we're different. And we should know it first. And that's a challenge I give you right now in your heart. Am I different from the world? Is there something about me that people can recognize? I know when I first gave my life to the Lord, and of course I was like, you know, you know how it is when you first give your life to the Lord, you're sharing with everybody you can all the time. That's part of that being that new Christian, that excitement. Then time goes by. And of course, I'm not saying that, uh, uh, you know, there doesn't need to be some temperance. You grow and you know that maybe you shouldn't share every second all the time the same thing over and over, especially to family that's heard it and they're getting upset with you, right? There's balance in all this, okay? We get that. But at the same time, you know, when we do that and, and we share and we, we, we talk to people about the Lord and, and this kind of stuff, you know, are, are we, you know, do we get to the point where we realize we're, even if we're not sharing, they, they know we're different. Sometimes I'll be around people and I'll think, can they tell that we're different? Like maybe they gather around a group of Christians. They're an unbeliever and they come to your house or they go to a church event and they know you believe in Jesus. They know what you stand for because it's a church event. But you wonder, can they tell a difference? The people that I've been able to follow up with that have, that have said something to me later on, and that it's happened several times throughout my life, they definitely see you as different. They can tell. You might think, well, they don't know. They, they know. Listen, we often talk about don't judge each other. Don't judge, don't judge. You're being judged every day by the world. They are judging you. Right now they're judging you because you call yourself a Christian. They're watching you. They're watching, okay, you go to church, now how do you live? What do you say? Are you any different than I am? And by the way, if we don't present ourselves as any different than the world around us, what benefit is it to become a Christian? Why not just continue on living the way I'm living? There's no real difference. 
there needs to be a difference. And that difference is holiness, set apart for God, walking in righteousness for the, uh, for the Lord. Again, you, we can say whatever we want as a Christian, but it's how we live that matters. And uh, again, I think that oftentimes we've lowered the standards so much in the church that people can't tell the difference. And I think a lot of it comes from maybe a, maybe a heart that starts out right. Here's what I mean. I've seen the church try to reach the world. And here's the problem I've watched happen. I think some of it may be very sincere, but I believe it's sincerely wrong. By the way, how many of you guys know that sincerity doesn't mean you're right? Does anybody know that? How sincere is the Mormon? How sincere is the Muslim? How sincere is the, is the Buddhist? Fill in the blank. Very sincere. Sincerity doesn't mean you're right. Sincerity just means you're sincere. And sincerity is not enough. There has to be more than, than sincerity. And I think that oftentimes the church has tried very sincerely to reach the world, note this, by becoming more like it. Okay? Here's what I mean. Paul said this, I become all things that I might reach some. Paul wasn't saying I'm becoming like the world. Oh, you know, she's a prostitute. I'll be one. If you take it that way, that's what you're going to have to say. This person is a thief. I'll become a thief. Hey, dude, I stole this too. Come on, hide over here with me. Has anybody shared Jesus with you? <laughs> what? You're a Christian? You just don't? Yeah, shh, you know. <laughs> I'm becoming all things to all men that I may reach some for Christ, right? It's not what he's saying. What he's saying is I find out where they are in their mindset and I adapt. Where are they? What are they going to hear? Am I going to close their ears off or open ears up? And I need to become all things. I need to reach the thief where they are. And that might be, you know what? You know, whatever the case might be, giving some example of stealing things, saying, you know what, things that maybe, you know, that we've stolen from the Lord that we should have given him or whatever the case might be. There are ways we can associate. If you're going to reach out to a football team, you know, learn a little bit about football. Speak the language. A better way to say what Paul was saying is, I've learned to speak everyone's language so I can share Jesus with everybody. But here's where the church has messed up in many areas of America where I see a lack of holiness, a falling away, and the church becoming more like the world. They've made this mistake. They're becoming like the world in order to reach the world. Okay? The world likes ACDC. We'll play ACDC as our first song. Listen, churches have done that. There are churches for a while playing ACDC on the opening song, and their justification was, well, you know what? That's the only way that the rockers are going to be drawn in, man, you know? Listen. Jesus never became like the world in order to reach the world. I don't really like that when everybody repeats things, but I'm going to do it. Jesus never became like the world to reach the world. He stayed completely Jesus. He stayed completely holy, and he stayed completely separate from the world. But he went right in the middle of them and showed them God's love. And there's the difference. Right in the middle of them. You just walk right up. I remember in Nashville one time after I'd gotten saved and we're doing some street witnessing that was an outdoor rock concert, right? And believe it or not, I mean, that's what I came out of so I can associate with these guys. And so I'm just walking up to him sharing. I'm like, hey, you know, ever, anybody ever talked to you about the Lord? It's like, you know, hey, we're trying to like party here and watch the concert, you know? And I didn't want to, you know, we didn't do it during the song. We catch breaks, you know, and this kind of thing because we're not going to listen to you anyway. But I say, has anybody let you know that God just loves you? And I had a heart for that, for that particular crowd because I came out of that. And I know, I know how they think. I know what, they're, what they're, they're trying to fill this thing in the flesh that's never gonna be filled. It's just, I gotta have more and more and more. You gotta keep filling. It never works. It leads to more and more darkness and sadness and loneliness and hopelessness. And so you start sharing and they would actually listen because I was simply saying, hey, I know where you're coming from. Listen, are you empty right now? Well, I'm feeling pretty good right now. Yeah, but are you really happy? Well, no, I'm not really happy. Why not? I said, it makes you feel good for a while, doesn't it? Get a buzz going, good music. But you wake up the next day, and not only do you have a hangover, but you're emptier than you were the day before. And when you catch those that have been doing that for a while, they're like, you know what? What are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to tell you Jesus loves you. And all this stuff you're pouring down your throat and sniffing up your nose, it's just going to leave you emptier and sadder and in worse health and miserable. And you're going to one day die and be separated from God eternally. Jesus says, I've opened the door. You can join me in heaven at my table and it will satisfy. 
It will satisfy now, and it will satisfy eternally. And that's a satisfaction the flesh can never give you. Listen, if you're trying to satisfy yourself right now by something sinful, it will give you an immediate high. It'll give you an immediate whatever, okay? It doesn't even have to be drugs. But as soon as you're done, you're right back to where you were. You need more. You need more. You need more. Only Jesus can come in and say, I've settled it, and it's a done deal. And I think that we need to let the world know, you know what? We're not like the world. We're like Jesus, but we can come to you right where you are, and we can love you right where you are. And Jesus loves you right there in the middle of your rock and roll or whatever you're doing. He loves you, but he, he's saying you gotta come out of it. You need to repent, and he'll give you hope. He'll give you life. He'll fill your heart. And he's saying to some, to some of you this morning the same thing. Maybe not coming out of rock and roll. I don't know. Maybe you are. Not that rock and roll necessarily, rock and roll in and of itself is sinful. I'm not saying that. There's some great Christian rock and roll, and even generic rock and roll that just kind of is rock and roll. I mean, the bottom line, it's not about music. And how I got on this rock and roll thing, I don't know. I have to believe there's a rocker in here who needs Christ. And I say that tongue in cheek, but if you're a rocker in here and you don't know the Lord Jesus, says, now change this message for you. Listen to me. He stopped a message that a pastor had planned in advance on paper to say, I love you so much that if you'll hear my voice today, I'll bring you into the kingdom of God. Now you need to respond to that. You need, I could be wrong. I'm not pulling one of those, somebody here's got a sore knee. You ever those guys, somebody's got a sore knee. Well, you're pretty much gonna hit half of us over 50, right? <laughs> I talked to somebody coming this morning, they were like, oh, I'm so stiff. I said, working out? No, I just got up. I'm like, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you on that. I just got up. It's like, ah, oh, right? It just things change as you get older. If that's you and wherever you are, whatever you're doing, and you're trying to feel something, whether it's that or something else, this is the Lord interrupting all these people that have gathered here to speak specifically to you. That's pretty, you're pretty important to him to do that. Now, it's up to you to respond. What, what do I do, Mark? You need to say, God, forgive me of my sin. I know that I'm empty, and I realize you've just spoken to me from some guy up there that I've never met, but I know you're talking to me, so you need to ask forgiveness of your sin. You need to say, Lord, I believe you died for me on the cross, and you need to give your life to him. And if you do that, you will be born again. And here's the great news I have for you. As empty as I was and as empty as you are now, you will be filled. You'll be filled. And you'll be happy and you'll be satisfied. Let's pray right now. Everybody pray. Let's, let's bow our heads. Father, I just pray right now for whoever this is, this is for. And I don't know why you interrupted this. I believe you did. I'm not going to pull the old I heard from God thing and try to sound spiritual. Because it may just be me. But God, you, you sent me off on a tangent. I was not thinking about it all. It's not in my notes. It's nothing to do with much of anything other than someone here I think you love. Maybe listening by radio. Maybe watching on the internet. But maybe in this very room. And if that's you right now and God is convicting your heart, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And I give my life to you. And Lord, I pray now you would fill that empty place in my heart that I've been trying to fill with all the stuff of the world that's been failing. And that you would now, Lord, fill me with you that I might know your joy and your peace forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us today on Come to the Table with Pastor Mark Kirk. We're in the book of Titus, and it's always interesting to learn more about these letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to his friends and companions. Titus was one of those who Paul mentored. Titus even accompanied Paul on one of the three missionary journeys. So there's a lot of relationship these two had. It's obvious that Paul held Titus in high regard as he praised him for his affection, earnestness, and ability to bring comfort to others. Wouldn't that be something to be spoken of with such high praises? Part of why we're here is to be in relationship with others and to remind people of the type of love and compassion Jesus shows. Titus was an exemplary person in this way. If today's teaching has sparked some questions that you just can't wait to get answered, we'd love to speak with you. Give us a call at 865-609-1385. It would be wonderful to be in relationship with you and have a conversation about what you've heard. Once again, that's 865-609-1385. If you're in the Knoxville area, come join us at Calvary Knoxville this Sunday. We'd be so happy to meet you in person. Feel free to refer to our website for service times, thewaymedia.net. You'll notice a Calvary Knoxville tab at the top of the page. 
As our time comes to a close today, we trust that you've been encouraged through this teaching in Titus. Please make a point to join us next time as there's much more to learn in this New Testament book here on Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.